Have you thought through how you're going to bring project-based learning to your school? You probably don't want another top-down initiative because that feels like something that's being done to your staff. It doesn't feel right. You want a grassroots movement for PBL, but how do you start a grassroots movement? Doesn't that kind of go against the definition? Are you going to train your whole staff or are you going to bring in a leadership team? I'd recommend a leadership team to get started. You can do your whole staff. Depends on your culture, but I love the leadership team piece. We've got a conference coming up in June just for that. So if that's your implementation plan to use a leadership team, come with us in Indianapolis for two days. You will leave with a three-year plan for implementing project-based learning that's not just created by you. It's created by your team. Your team will be you. You'll be a part of it. It could be your administrative team. It also should be some teacher leaders. So now you're starting to build a grassroots movement. You have people that are more excited about PBL than you or as excited as you are, and they can start doing some things in the classroom and show the rest of your staff what PBL can look like. If you want to sign up for that conference, go to the link in the show notes. Right now, we only plan on taking five teams. So if that's an option you want to do with your team, you do really need to jump on that. If you're already on board and you know you want to do this, you want to be customized, we also have two design days where we can come to you. You can actually come to one of our model schools. We'll run a similar idea. These two days are totally customized to you, though. And then your team, again, leadership team, leaves with a three-year plan. But if you come to our model school, you get to see it in action. We pull you back out, and then we help you figure out how you can do that at your school. Are your teachers fighting apathy in their classrooms? Do you have teachers that are burned out or leaving your school? Are you having trouble keeping your energy and passion levels up? Maybe your passion levels are overflowing and you see the vision coming. You need help. How do you figure out how to change education? If you answered yes to any of these questions, you are in the right place, my friend. I'm Ryan Stoyer, and this is PBL Simplified Podcast, dedicated to equipping you to be a visionary leader who's committed to self-development, collaboration, and changing education. Is this podcast about project-based learning? 100%. Do you as a visionary leader need more than just PBL? 100%. PBL is that instructional model. It's the piece of the change process that you need because it's tangible. Your teachers can see the change. They can feel the change in the mindset. There's a right and wrong way to do it. We've figured it out over the last decade, and I want to help you do that. This is a difficult time in education, but the fact is that you were made for a time such as this, and I'm here to guide you down the path to fulfill your vision. Welcome, Visionary Leader. Today on the podcast, we've got a need to know of how do we find community partners. And yes, I do cherry pick the community partner questions that come in. I love them. I think that they're the cornerstone of the work that we do because it needs to be authentic and real world. So you will hear a lot about community partners. If you have some other questions, you can still go to the show notes and hit Ask Ryan. I'll make sure that I work your questions in. The Leadership Leap which is a chance for you to hear my take on different leadership books to see if you want to dive in even more, which I think you will on today's book, or you can glean some lessons that I've taken out of these books as well. Today's book is called It Takes What It Takes by Trevor Howard. Uh, I think you're going to love it. Uh, If you're, you're the leader, if this is the right podcast for you, then you are doing whatever it takes to make these things happen. And Oddly enough, Trevor has ways to make that sustainable so that you're not just burning out. Our episode topic for today is define the ideal. What does your best case for education look like for you? It's a follow-up to last week's leadership episode two weeks ago where we defined the dissonance. What's wrong with education? You can feel there's something different, but now we need to dream and define the ideal so we know where we're taking people to. A green drink is part of my morning routine and has been for years. My green drink is Athletic Greens. 75 high-quality vitamins, minerals, and whole foods sourced nutrients. Comprehensive nutrition in one simple scoop. You build a healthy daily habit in one minute per day. Check out the link in the show notes to get a bonus travel pack and a vitamin D supplement. Our need to know for today is how do we find community partners? Ask, ask, ask ask and then ask 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 some more now it's not a cold call ask though i'm not don't get your you know your dial a thon on and just start calling like crazy but do ask ask and invite uh, there's a school in uh, downtown indianapolis 
um, where they're working with some kids that are trying to get things back on track. And Joe does a great job of inviting people, right? He just sends out an invite to the community partners that he knows well and some that he doesn't. And he's got a great line in there where, like, your presence makes a difference. You're not inviting the community partner to come in and give a keynote. It's not a high-pressure piece. It's, hey, on this day, would you come give us an hour of your time? When you come in, it makes a difference. And he has this opening day community partner uh, event. And it does two things. One, it lets community partners know that they're welcome in this school. Two, it lets the learners know that their work is important and that community partners are coming in to showcase it. So on both sides, you're getting a win. Community partners can see where they fit, and the learners begin to see right off the bat that their work's important and community partners are going to be involved. It's a brilliant strategy, and it really just starts with an ask, an invite. He created a really nice one-pager, and then he sends it out via email and says, hey, would you come? He also calls, and wherever he's at, if he's at a rotary meeting or if he's at an event, He's looking for community partners that can come in because he understands the power of them. So it's ask, 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 and then have a place for them to come in. That's how you get community partners in your building and in your classrooms. It Takes What It Takes by Trevor Moad. You'll learn that champions don't think negatively or positively. They think neutrally. You'll learn that champions behave as if they have no choice. You'll learn that champions make detailed plans. You'll learn that champions visualize what they want. You'll learn that champions lead themselves before they lead others. And then he says, you can do this. It's super good. He really works with uh, professional athletes. And this ideal of neutral thinking is really, really important one. You know, you take out some of the emotion to things and you look at it neutrally. So here's what Trevor is. He's a mental conditioning coach to elite performers. He's well known for being a mental coach for Seattle Seahawks quarterback Russell Wilson, has worked closely with prestigious NCAA football programs and coaches, though so he's in that professional athlete uh, arena. And I, I love getting some of these insights from these guys because they're the ones that train their minds to do the work. And if you're a visionary leader, you know that your work is not going to get done this year. right? It's definitely not going to get done this second semester. Like That's why we plan three years out. But you can't wait till two and a half years and be like, hey, did I make it? It starts now with mental toughness so that you can work out the habits to achieve those goals that you've set. And you've heard that over and over again. But it's really important to see that that's what our top performers do. All right. It's what you do, not how you feel, that gets things done. We can do our way into feeling the way we need to. It's hard to feel our way into achieving a darn thing. So let me, that last part's kind of confusing. So let me say it again. We can do our way into feeling the way we need to. So when you do the work and you achieve the goals, then you get the right feelings. But it's hard to feel our way into achieving anything. So neutral thinking, here's, here's his words again. Neutral thinking is a high performance strategy that emphasizes judgment free thinking, especially in crisis and pressure situations. This is where quarterback throws interception after interception after interception becomes right back onto the field and throws a touchdown pass, right? If I threw three, inter three interceptions and I got down on myself, then the fourth pass is going to be an interception, right? But neutral thinking lets you say, what needs to be done right now? What do you need to do next, right? Maybe you bombed a conversation with a parent or a kid or a staff member, or you went to launch your vision and it didn't go like you thought it would. We'll need neutral thinking, like what do you need to do next, because the plan that you lay out, even the three-year plan we do with the design days, you've got to have an inspiring vision to put out there. But it's probably not going to be the one plan that you put out there. Like It's going to have course adjustments. So you need to be able to uh, think neutrally to say, yes, this is my plan that I've created. But now I'm willing to adjust it without getting my feelings hurt. And I don't know that we get feelings as leaders, right? I'm sure you have them. But when you're making decisions, it's neutral time. Right, so you can make the right decision. All right, another conversation from Trevor with Vince Carter. During that 2015 conversation I had, Vince Carter asked a question. Or I asked Vince Carter a question. Is choice an illusion? Of course, he said. 
There was no way he'd still be in the NBA in his late 30s if he'd done everything he wanted to do. He did what was demanded, so it takes what it takes. Exactly, he said. That's the title of the book, It Takes What It Takes. Does it take you having habits that most people don't adhere to? Yes. Are you going to have to eat right? Yes. Are you going to have to work out? Yes. Do you need a green drink? Yes. And I've got some other things. I do do meditation. I do cold showers. uh, I read every single day, like without exception, because it takes what it takes. Like there's no, the illusion is choice. I don't have a choice. I have goals that I want to achieve and you do too. You have goals that you want to achieve and there have to be things that, that you do every single day. He's got a pretty interesting uh, metaphor he puts together here, goats and goats. So there was a time in sports where if you messed up, you were called the goat, right? Like you were looked down upon because you messed up. And now we know often that goat, right, stands for greatest of all time. And his point is that you have to be willing to be the goat, the G-O-A-T, the lowercase, the one that messes up, that doesn't look good, that looks bad at some point. If you're not willing to do that, you never get to be the greatest of all time goat. If you're not willing to throw the interception, you don't get the chance to throw the touchdown. At some point, you have to give that visionary speech. Right, even if you don't, even if it doesn't go well, uh, you have to be able to be in a position to take the chance that it will go well. Right, and most of the time it does. Right, we just talk ourselves out of it. Right, you've got to be able to take the swing. Right, the Babe Ruth theory that you've got to be able to strike out if you want to hit the home runs. The law of substitution, A.K.A. the law of focus. My inner voice is loudest. If I don't use it strategically, however, then the words of others or the outside can replace my message to myself. My own words influence me ten times as much as anyone else's. The law of focus, or the law of substitution. What does your inner voice tell you? Are you defining your inner voice? Which part of that are you listening to? I've got a set of affirmations that I listen to daily so that I know what it is I tell myself, right? I tell myself that I don't have an extra helping. It's part of who I am. I tell myself that I finish my workout hard. I tell myself that I'm a good sleeper so that I can sleep because it's important. That's what high flyers do. What does your voice tell you? Are you fighting it still or are you controlling it? High flyers control the inner voice. So in that vein of thinking, uh, this book takes the idea of the illusion of choice, that you're going to make a choice so that you don't have to make choices, essentially. He says, deep down, we all know our choices ultimately determine how our behaviors and those behaviors ultimately determine our outcomes. But it doesn't make choosing correctly any easier in our own lives. We see this with learners in the classroom making bad decisions. You're like, no, let me help you with that. But we have those same decisions to make daily, right? So what's a decision that you need to make to eliminate choice, right? Like I know that I'm going to podcast weekly. I'm going to put a YouTube video out every week. I'm going to write a, I'm writing a book as well for next year. So that means I have things I have to do every single day to do those things. And I set them up and it's not a choice, right? I'm going to plan. I'm going to, I'm going to record. I'm going to edit. We're going to publish. Like those things are going to happen every single week. I put it out to the world. I put it out to you. So you expect it. And now I'm going to walk through those choices by putting that out there. It informs all the other choices that I'm going to make. And essentially they feel like they're not choices because I know I'm going to do these things. Super exciting book. It takes what it takes. Um, grab a copy, learn from it, whatever you want to do. But he goes through a ton of different examples of people that do exactly what it takes. And you say, well, how, what does it take? Well, it takes what it takes. Like you have a vision and you have to pay the price for your vision. Now, it doesn't mean that you sacrifice family. It doesn't mean you sacrifice yourself. There's a sustainable model for this. It takes what it takes. You have to make some hard decisions. There will be some things that you don't do anymore so that you can do the things that fulfill your vision because it's going to take what it takes. Before we dive into our main episode, I want to talk again about these design days because our main episode today is about the ideal educational environment. So we have this two-day workshop called Design Days. We actually hold it at a model school system where uh, the work is happening. Right? They have the mindsets there. They're implementing student-centered classrooms. They're using project-based learning. 
at a mindset level. So we take you there so you can feel the mindset happening. You can see what happens with learners. You can see how empowered your staff is. So then you leave those two days of a design day uh, with a three-year plan and how you'll implement a grassroots movement for project-based learning. You say, can I plan a grassroots movement? Yes, you can. It's how you inspire people. It's how you bring mindset. And it's how you guide people to the work. So every visionary leader can define the ideal educational environment. And in this episode, we're going to go through that in three specific areas. But I would encourage you to look at the show notes and you can schedule design days. Come have a conversation with us. Well, I think there's more to this question of the ideal educational environment, right? You can watch uh, Sir Ken Robinson's video, right? You can start to dream about some things in education. You can do this for hours. What we're going to look at is we're going to look at a couple, we're going to look at three different areas. The first one we'll look at is the ideal graduate protocol. You can run this with your staff. You can run it with your leadership team. You should probably do it yourself so you can see where you're at. And it's the basic idea is that when a learner graduates from your school, whether it's elementary school, middle school, or high school, it's what do you want them to think? What do you want them to say? What do you want them to be able to do? And just set up these three categories. You can do it on chart paper. Uh, you can do this in small groups. Uh, but what do you want them to think, say, and do? And again, there are a lot of ways to do it. You can do it with your staff in small groups. You can do it yourself. Now, let me give you an example. I worked with a science uh, department in a middle school, and they did very well in standardized tests, but there was still that dissonance, right? That part is like, nah, something's not quite adding up. So I asked them the question, you know, what do you want your middle schoolers to remember about science when they leave? I said, well, I, I want them to be able to problem solve and think of different solutions. I want them to be able to understand how an experiment can have uh, one variable and you can't have 18 different variables. So you never really know what the problem is or what the solution is. And But none of these things were like individual 8.2.1 content standards, right? Now they were like the overarching standards, right? That you might have in your standards in your state. These larger essential questions that states are moving towards. So it was those, but it was like really a scientific mind is what we want our learners to have when they leave. So I said, okay, these are great ideas. Is everybody behind these? Yep, everybody's behind these. Well, how many of these are you moving towards like in your classroom? Like, are you moving kids towards these mindsets? And we found out really quickly that they were not, right? Like self, self-assessment, self the teacher said, no, we're not really moving towards this. We've got them memorizing things. We've got them doing labs that, you know, we know what the outcome is already. You know, if it doesn't bubble blue, then you did it wrong. Right, so they knew they had these things. And then we started to make small changes to move towards the mindset work. So it wasn't a giant complete overhaul. People didn't freak out. But it started with the awareness through defining the ideal. And then they started to make changes. They saw where they were. We all know where we're at. We showed them the ideal. They actually came up with the ideal themselves. Right. That's how we start building grassroots movements, even when we're kind of nudging people in that direction. And they said, huh. I do want my learners to have this scientific mind. I'd like to bring more of this into my classroom. And that's how they started bringing project-based learning in, is they defined the ideal. So if you're going to create a vision for each of these three areas, that's kind of what an ideal graduate is. So how are we going to do What do you want your learners to think? So in this science example, they really started to define what they want their learners to think and the minds that they want them to have. Another one was, what do you want them to say? And this was interesting because you get a, a couple different paths that teachers often take here is we want them to say things where they have empathy for the fellow man, right? For the person next to them. Like, do you need help? Can I help you? Um, I see that you're hurting, right? Have you tried this? Or can I give you some solutions? Can I help you out? This whole idea of empathy and just the personness that we want our learners to have. The other one was employability skills. I want them to be able to shake someone's hand and say, how are you doing? And be able to do small talk with someone in business. Because when they get in business, they're going to have to do this small talk. It's a huge part of business, actually. Uh, you know, I was an engineer at a Fortune 50 company. And much of the work was really done uh, on smoke breaks a lot of the time, right? It's like, well, how did you get to talk to the district manager? It's like, oh, smoke breaks. So I don't smoke, but I went on smoke breaks, 
right? So I just called them fresh air breaks. I went on fresh air breaks because these small informal conversations is where we got a lot of the work done, right? It wasn't in a formal meeting environment where you, you couldn't call somebody out or you can't always say the truth, right? You have to kind of shade things so that it's appropriate or politically correct, whatever that is. But it was a small individual informal conversations where a lot of the work got done. What if our learners could master that or at least had a beginning step to see that that was important? So those are kind of the two avenues that often come out uh, when we do this protocol with teachers. And the last one is, what do we want them to be able to do? Right? And here, you still get some content answers. Most of these are not standards-based answers. But, you know, slope-intercept form doesn't always come up right here. But being able to write well, being able to speak intelligently, to present, these ideas come out. We also want them to be able to think and problem-solve and work in groups. That comes out in here. And that comes out because our industry partners are asking for those things. So I need people that can work with different groups and different departments. So how do we create an environment where our learners will be able to do those things? And I'm going to claim that the first step, I guess technically the second step in this process, is defining the ideal. So define the dissonance in this case is our learners can't really work in groups well. Define the ideal. They can work in groups efficiently and they produce a better product than they would on their own. Okay, now how do we start to get there? And once you define the dissonance, define the ideal, you our brains almost immediately start thinking of solutions. And if you're doing this in groups, you see the solutions come out of your staff or even yourself. And the key is, is you want them to come out of your staff more than you. That's how you start to build the grassroots mindset. That's why the collaborative environment is so important. It's not you speaking to your staff and telling them what to do. Even if they're really great insights, you need them to discover those insights on their own. And the double magic is then they provide that same environment for their learners, and the learners start to become empowered, and they discover solutions on their own. We see it again and again. This process works. Uh, but the ideal graduate, it's more than a fancy logo that goes up on your website, although that can be a driving force. You put it all over your school. The community knows about it. But the process is really, really important. So I do not want you to create an ideal graduate and say, hey, this is what we're doing. Even if you're right, it's not going to matter. It's in the process of helping people define the ideal graduate that they start to come up with grassroots solutions. And now you've got 30 people thinking of solutions instead of just you. And that's where it's really leadership and not just doing ship. Right? So that's where you become a leader and you start to draw those things out of your folks. And that's when you become a visionary leader and become is a strong word. You're becoming. I don't think we ever fully make it right. It's a process and it's a journey. So you have to define the ideal. Man, that's it. So we've defined the distance. We defined the, the ideal. That's it for today. The next leadership leap, we're going to define the path. We're going to start talking about how this looks out over three years how you start to create some benchmarks so that you know that you're leading people in the right direction. So your call to action for today is I want you to go to the Magnify Learning website, click on the button in the top right that says book a workshop, and in there it's going to ask you some questions. And in there I just want you to put design days. And then we're going to give you a call. We'll tell you about design days and see if they work for you. It's a customized version of our conference that's going to happen in June. We can do it in June if you want. But if you want it to be customized, you know this is the direction you want to go, give us a call and we'll customize it specifically for you and your team. Next week, we've got a leadership guest episode. Do not miss that one. You're going to want to see that Visionary Leaders. It's going to be fantastic. And as we continue on this journey, we'll engage your learners, tackle boredom, and transform your classrooms. Go Lead Inspired. Thank you for listening to this episode of the PBL Simplified Podcast. Would you help us achieve our vision of 51 by 2051? One small step you can take to help us out is to leave a review of the PBL Simplified Podcast. Scroll down to the bottom of our show page, select a star rating, and leave a review. Your review helps others find this podcast. When you leave a review, the next visionary leader will see your words and join us. Thank you for leading inspired. Music